evening and welcome to Nisa. I'm Salma Tijela. Coming up in tonight's edition of Nisa, Minister of Political and Public Affairs presents members of the newly reconstituted African Peer Review Mechanism National Governing Council to the President. Businessman and flag bearer aspirants of the All People's Congress, Mosri Fadika dies in a London hospital. Minister of Energy calls on solar equipment dealers to join the Enable Energy Association. And the Minister of Health and Sanitation to establish a functional national emergency medical service system. All the stories on my good business and sports are lined up tonight. tonight for our first story the minister of political and public affairs nanette thomas has presented members of the newly reconstituted african peer review mechanism national governing council to the president at state house Raza bashkema sent us this report for nisa the Review Mechanism National Governing Council, the Minister of Political and Public Affairs, Madam Nane Thomas, said the APRM is a good governance monitoring instrument of the African Union that seeks, among other things, to bring together an effective collaboration among the three major actors in the search for good governance in Africa, including government, civil society, and the private sector. She maintained that accordingly, the APRM continental and national structures put emphasis on collective body of members of government, the private sector, and civil society in an African peer review mechanism governing council. For presenting these members, I want to humbly remind you, sir, of the rescheduled special APRM summit for Nairobi, Kenya, 26 August on the revitalization of the APRM, of which you are a very critical person in the deliberations, especially that our sister, West African country, Senegal, will also be peer-reviewed. It is important that you attend this meeting as your colleagues, heads of state, expecting your input in adherence to the APRM principles. The executive chairman, APRM National Governing Council, and the chief executive officer, Professor Usman Bla, registered their profound thanks and appreciation of his good governance strides in Sierra Leone. He pointed out that he has served the APRM successfully in a number of good governance oriented projects in the country, including the Open Governance Initiative and Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, among others. Professor Gula maintained that those programs are all geared towards ensuring sustainable peace and security in Sierra Leone. He made it clear to President Koroma that he has also been very critical and instrumental in ensuring the successful and implementation of the APRM in Sierra Leone by his dedicated and unwavering political commitment to the process. Sir, as a newly established body, we've just say, identified and put up a strategic plan with key deliverables, one of which is the preparation for your presentation of the third and fourth progress report scheduled for the APRM forum in 2017, January. And secondly, the effective and successful popularization of the APRM in this country. You know, that is why, in fact, the revitalization of the continental secretariat is of the view that we need to step up the steam of popularizing the APRM because they realize the steam is dying down. In his contribution, the Deputy Minister of Political and Public Affairs, Ahmed Femi Mansouré, said this is another opportunity that further makes His Excellency the President a unique leader 
The Deputy Minister commended President Koroma for keeping the records in Sierra Leone and informed him that it took them 90 days to get the team of the members that are being presented to him. Welcoming members of the newly reconstituted African Peer Review Mechanism APRM National Governing Council, President Koroma congratulated them on the appointment to man the affairs of the APRM. The president pointed out that as a nation, they have succeeded in their activities and that they have submitted the country's first and second reports, which was well reviewed by their peers. He maintained that the comments during and after the submission were very laudable and as a government, they decided to take a review at a time when other countries would not dare expose themselves to such a mechanism. President Koroma noted with pride that as a government, they did the exposure because they were confident that the government was open, transparent, and that they have worked very well even though it was close to the elections. He observed that now, as a government and country, they are getting ready for the third and fourth report that they should submit in January 2017. Therefore, as a body, they now have the responsibility to ensure that they sustain the momentum. President Koma expressed with delight that they have a plan of action to popularize the report for the first and second submissions and express his fervent hope that they will embark on it as soon as they are through with the next meeting of the APRM. I am happy that you have a plan of action uh, to A, popularize the reports of the, of the first and uh, second submissions mm -hmm. and I hope that uh, you will embark on it as soon as uh, you are through with uh, the next meeting of uh, the APRM and I think it should be early enough so that the populace will be fully geared and uh, fully knowledgeable about the issues of the APRM even before we uh, make our <coughs> third and fourth submissions in January. I want to assure you that uh, I will continue to give support to the activities of uh, the Governing Council. Uh, we will ensure that um, um, our participations at the meetings, at <coughs> the international meetings, uh, go on very well. And, uh, we have, I'm sure we have uh, fruitful. That was President Kruma addressing members of the reconstituted African Peer Review Mechanism Governing Council. The Ministry of Energy has ended a visitation to solar equipment dealers in Freetown to sensitize them on government and energy revolution and need to join the association. The Renewable Energy Association is to educate solar panel dealers on its operations and why they should import more solar panels. Daphne Kemamakoli reports. is to sensitize solar panel dealers on the significance of the Energy Revolution project launched three months ago. The Energy Revolution project is an additional effort by government through the Ministry of Energy to provide electricity in the country through the use of solar energy in homes. In line with this, the government has set the pace with 50,000 solar units that will be distributed countrywide. Then we get light. But on our no service as president, it don't always say private sector for the government. A private sector now get for good economy. So that make we government can meet who now the private sector today. So then we we'll join, we we'll get one word, we we'll make, make sure to achieve the vision of Mr. President get. So they don't tell you about the standard for you set your own good and for you good name your reputation. Import products that we get good standard. We go last long for the customer themselves, we go benefit. You said we will get a day. We register the ministry. All the facilities every government will provide in terms of the duty, the waiver, in terms of the, the green uh, lane, 
any facility and support the government provide, you said could they inside away for benefits. Yeah? The Renewable Energy Association in Sierra Leone has been formed to unify solar panel dealers in Sierra Leone. The association is headed by Madam Sophie Johnson. And the government would not agree with uh, standard days, customs, that there will be a green lane. So on the Asapusa system, they will put zero rating, which we will all benefit from. But in order to go down that road, they're encouraging everybody to join the association. So if you're part of the association, you go automatically, when you go sky in, you go see zero. She said members would be trained on how to operate solar equipment. And on a very sad note, yesterday, Sierraleans were taken aback when news broke out that business tycoon and flag bearer aspirants of the main uh, of the ruling All People's Congress Party, Mr. Fadika, had died in the hospital in London. Mr. Fadika was head of the African Minerals, uh, the Iron Ore Mine. He was one of those who had thrown his hat into the ring for the APC flag bearer race. The Ministry of Health and Sanitation is set to establish a functional national emergency medical service system known as NEMS as one of components that will ensure a, a responsive health care system in Sierra Leone. The National Emergency Medical Service System is being sponsored by the World Bank to the Ministry of Health and Sanitation. The Minister of Health is going through necessary procurement processes to hire a management entity for the National Emergency Medical Service System. Well, to get further insight into the project, I have in the studios the Minister of Health and Sanitation, Dr. Abubakar Fofana. Welcome, sir, to News. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sarma. Okay, what more can you tell us about uh, this National Emergency Medical Services Center uh, system that you're about to establish? Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. And the public uh, may not be privy to this information, but uh, when His Excellency the President, Dr. Ernest Baikuruma, came into power for the first time in 2007, um, he engaged the Ministry of Health because he wanted to know um, what, are, with all the peripheral health units mm -hmm. that we have in the country, we have over 1,000 200 peripheral health units and uh, we have districts general hospitals in every single district uh, in this country and uh, on top of that we also have uh, this uh, faith-based hospitals and so on and so forth but despite all these huge investments in the medical uh, area he wanted to know specifically what are the barriers that are really preventing people from accessing health facilities so we conducted a study that is entitled Barriers to Accessing Health. Barriers to Accessing Health. So the study specifically looked at the, the barriers, the constraints that were stopping people from accessing. And uh, among the people that we had interviewed, about uh, 90, over 90% 90 cited cost as the major factor mm -hmm. that is preventing them from accessing services. You know, we still stuck in this, what I call, cash and carry system, mm -hmm. whereby when you present yourself to the facility, you have to pay upfront before you can be treated. So I call it cash and carry, because we haven't yet reached the stage where everybody is insured. Mm -hmm. So you go to the hospital, you just get treated, and the insurance is billed. We haven't got to that stage yet, so we're still stuck in this cash and carry system. So that is one of the, the major reasons why people are not accessing health. The second most important reason why people were not accessing health facilities has to do with the distance to the health facilities vis-a-vis uh, -vis the lack of a functional you know, transport system to move a patient from homes to the hospitals. And there are other smaller reasons, but they account for just maybe one percent. Okay, let us look at the issue of transportation because it appears that this is where this project is going to. Yeah, focus. that's what I was going. Yeah. So yeah. let us talk about uh, how much yeah. will this new project so, focus on? Because, like you mentioned, the issue of transportation moving patients mm -hmm. from one location to another is another challenge, and that is yeah. where the issue of ambulance, yeah. effective yes. ambulance system, comes in. Okay. So it is this study that actually informed the president's decision to usher in the free health care. But what the free health care, actually what it says is, is, if you are a pregnant woman or an under five child or a lactating woman, 
their yeah, treatment in all public health facilities is free. That's all what the, uh, the free healthcare says. What the free healthcare did not say is how does that five-year-old child or that pregnant woman or that lactating woman, how do they get to the facility? Mm -hmm. So it address the first constraint, that is the cost, but it doesn't address the second constraint, mm -hmm. the constraint of transportation to the facility. So this is what we are now trying to address, the so, second issue. All right, so let us talk about the second aspect, and that has to do with transportation. Uh, what is in this project that uh, we'll be looking at this area? What new or what new innovation? We all know when the you know the Ebola struck the country, uh, one critical area was that, like you mentioned, this mm. issue of moving you know patient from mm. one place to the other, mm. and we saw the huge presence of you know mm -hmm. ambulances in the country. Mm. Uh, what is different from that project and this okay, one? Okay, I will tell you. You know we have uh, an, an an ambulance management system currently in place in the country. That system has been in existence before you and me were born. And this is how it goes. Every year, the government buys ambulances and we send them to the hospitals. And we rely on the management of the hospitals, you know, to uh, manage these ambulances. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, sorry. Just So we rely on the management of the hospitals uh, you know, to manage these ambulances. But there are a number of drawbacks with the current ambulance system in the country. One, the first drawback is what I call the balance of power. The balance of power is not in favor of the people, in the sense that um, it is not the people that control the ambulance, the movement of the ambulance. It is the powers that be in the hospitals that decide where and when the ambulance goes. And this should not be the case in an ambulance service. It is the people that should control the movement of the ambulance. You and me and anybody, any of the seven million Australians should be able to pick his phone and call a number for an ambulance, and the ambulance goes and pick that person. Okay, so let us get an insight so is, how this new project is going to operate in terms yes. of ensuring that, uh, because we have seen, you know, hundreds or thousands of ambulances in this country, but how much is 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 and this ambulance is very much functional, it's another challenge. How will this new system create a more effective well, that's, that's, ambulance system? Uh, that's what exactly what I was trying to get the people to, to understand. Basically, there are three challenges with the current system of uh, managing ambulances in the country. One, there is inequity. Not everybody has equal access to the ambulances. Even me sitting here as a minister, I have friends, brothers, colleagues, and so calling me whenever they need an ambulance. And that is happening because there is not a system mm -hmm. in place. If there are systems in place, nobody needs to call the minister for an ambulance. Mm -hmm. You need an ambulance, there's a system mm -hmm. that's used. Whoever you are, whatever you are. So there's imbalance in the current system. The second problem with the current system of managing ambulance is the misuse of ambulances, which you and me know mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. I have caught about three ambulance drivers loading coal and uh, wood and in ambulances and I've prosecuted all three of them and they've been found guilty and they've been uh, fined and uh, so given court, uh, court uh, sentences and so on and so forth. The third problem with the current system of managing ambulances is sustainability issue. You will see an ambulance which is just six months old packed somewhere for something as minor as an oil filter or fuel filter. So these are the challenges. So how do we intend to go about these challenges? We intend to go about these challenges by establishing a separate entity, a separate body for managing ambulances. And that's what we call the National Emergency mm -hmm. Medical Services. So these services will kick in and they will be managing the ambulances in the country. So when will this project start? This project has already started in the sense that, um, for example, if you look at the newspapers, for, um, from yesterday, from last week, Friday even, to now, you will see adverts mm -hmm. calling for paramedics, mm -hmm. people in So how many paramedics do you need for these ambulances? Okay, that's fine. We will need, um, the actual number of paramedics we need is 489 paramedics nationwide. Okay. Yes, but uh, we will be recruiting 652. Okay, for paramedics. What yes. about the drivers? Um, we will not be, yes. The actual number we need is 489, okay. but uh, we'll, be, we'll be training 
652 paramedics. So out of the 652, when the firm comes, the company that's coming to manage the ambulance mm -hmm. is going to recruit the 400. So you mean it will be a private firm that will be managing the, the ambulance components of the Minister of Health? Yes, Health? for now. Okay. Yes, for now. And we have a reason for that. And then What's the for reason? a driver... What's the yes, reason for that? The reason for that is that this is a new initiative that we are bringing in. We don't have people in country with the, the experience of managing a national ambulance system. So we are going to leverage the expertise of somebody who has done it somewhere, either in Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, somewhere in Africa, or at least in a country with a challenges similar to... to so how ambulance. many ambulances are we talking about, Mr. Minister? Um, at any point, when the national ambulance system kicks in, at any point in time, there is going to be 163 ambulances on the road nationwide. At any hour? At any point in time, there will be 163 ambulances. So when will it kick start? Sorry? When will this project kick start? Well, we are on it now. We are now recruiting mm. the people who want to be paramedics. We are now recruiting people who want to be ambulance drivers. Mm. The advert is out for companies from all over the world okay. who think they have the expertise to come and uh, manage. So, the so how optimistic are, are you as a minister that with this new system, uh, looking at uh, you know a private company managing the entire process and the equipment of paramedics, it will be you know it will bring a new face how people are constrained to actually mm -hmm. get ambulance, even the way you know drivers mm -hmm. as well as other people manage ambulances in this country. Absolutely, so I'm very I'm very very optimistic that uh, this new system that I'm going to put in place will uh, really work in favor of the people okay. and will uh, overcome some of the challenges that we have with the ambulances presently. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. It's Minister. Uh, he's the Minister of Health and Sanitation, uh, Dr. Abu Bakar Fofana. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us on news hour tonight. We now move to another issue. The Maboka Old Student Association has sympathized with the family of the late Parliament Chief of Makari Plante Chiefdom, P.C. Masai Leontham II, at his residence in Pamela Bombali District. We'll now bring the highlight of the visit. to demonstrate your appreciation of a great occasion. Believe me, you bring it now. We could have put a lot of uh, goats together. We could have put sheep together. We could have put other creatures. But believe me, the role, the importance, the significance of the cow in the tradition of us, Muslims and Christians alike, cannot be underestimated. And therefore, you are here. Believe me, MOBA, being the great association it is, believe me, has not left out the value of the cow. So MOBA, in its wisdom, has asked me to inform the family that we are bringing two cows as a presentation to the family to cry with them, to mourn with them, to show solidarity this great thing. So we brought the symbols. I will again take the liberty of asking to represent it to count on my putting down on this great loss. Having reached that, we are not going to stop there. For total money, what I mean, I the so having done that, Imami, the God bless us. On whatever forward, let our motto be. cross-section of the Maboroka All Student Association visiting the family of the late permanent chief of Makaribanti Chiefdom, P.C. Masai Leon Tham II. The Law Department for Abbey College University of Sierra Leone has early debates on the topic should the abortion be repassed into law in Sierra Leone. The debate was organized to know how the Law Department views the controversial abortion bill. First, Zanema reports.
abortion bill was tabled before Parliament, there has been lots of debate as to whether the bill be passed into law or not. Religious groups argued that the law should not be passed because Sierra Leone is a godly nation and it is against Christianity and Islam. Whilst organizations supporting the bill say safe abortion will prevent women dying due to unsafe abortion. The Law Department of FBC organized this debate to ensure first-year students speak for or against the bill. The debaters who were in favor of the bill argued that the safe abortion bill is in fulfillment of several UN conventions that Sierra Leone is a signatory to and it will help women to give birth by choice, prevent untimely death, among others. Those that argued against the bill described the title as deceptive as, according to them, no abortion is safe. They said the country's health system is not strong to accommodate abortion and that the bill is secretly sponsored by the Western world to reduce the population of Africa. At the end of the debate, Wisdom Kante and Mary Fofana, who were against the bill, took first and second positions, whilst Fatimata Kamara, who debated for the motion, took the third position. Lecturer at Law Department Frabe College Rashid Dumbuya thanks the students for taking part in the debate. Magistrate Dr. Abu Bakar Bine Kamara and Magistrate George Samai were awarded for their outstanding contributions to the department. The president of the International Fund for Agriculture and Development, Dr. Kanai Wenzi, as part of his two day visit to Sterling, has briefed the media about EFED's activities in the country. In a press conference at the Redison Blue Hotel, Aberdeen, the EFED president disclosed that his organization will give Sterling $20 million. Ask me if I was among journalists. A member of EFED more than two decades ago, this is the first time an EFED president is visiting Sierra Leone. The Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Professor Monty Jones and Dr. Kanayo Nwanzi had worked in the same institution and had built a strong relationship. IFAD is the UN specialized agency that promotes both agriculture and financial activities. The host Sierra Leone's Minister of Agriculture, Professor Monty Jones, said the visit of the IFAD's president is a testament that the country is on the right track. The agriculture minister explained to his guests that agriculture is part of the presidential recovery priorities and that his ministry is implementing strategies to revolutionize agriculture in Sierra Leone. Professor Jones called on Sierra Leoneans to eat local grown food as a way of reducing the importation of goods that can be planted here. As of the press, IFAD is in the, they are supporting projects, projects to do with agricultural development, with rural development, and uh, since <coughs> Dr. Kanai Wanzi took up the office. We've seen increased funding to Sierra Leone. And the meeting that we had today was very remarkable. First of all, the president, we pledged continued support to Sierra Leone to promote our agricultural efforts. We want us to be in a position where we're going to reduce drastically the importation of commodities that we can produce. The IFAD president, Dr. Nwanzi, disclosed that in the next two years, IFAD will spend $20 million in Sierra Leone. Dr. Nwanzi said IFAD invests in rural people to help them move out of poverty and hunger. The IFAD president informed journalists that Africa receives 50% of IFAD's funds, as 70% of the poor people live in rural areas. He called on Africans to eat local foodstuffs, as $35 billion is spent in sub-Saharan Africa on importation alone. Money, he said, could be used to improve agriculture. We have evidence that our contribution to agriculture and rural development <coughs> has resulted in improving incomes, food and nutrition security in rural areas, particularly in providing smallholder farmers or small producers access to inputs, irrigation facilities, technical skills, as the Honorable Minister said, access to markets, to local and regional markets, and of course, rural financial services. As I said, these are always in line with government priorities. 
Now, you will agree with me, ladies and gentlemen, that most of the food we consume domestic, domestically is produced by small, small holders in rural areas. But the paradox, the irony, is that they are also the poorest, essentially because they are also major buyers of food. Most of our farmers are still subsistence in their production, with very little commercialization. And this has to change, just as the minister said. As he ends his visit to Sierra Leone, the IFAD boss wonders why a country like ours, in his own words, has everything but yet still imports nearly all its foodstuffs. He was upbeat. According to him, with sound policies and programs, Sierra Leone should not only feed itself, but should create employment for young people. The host was happy to be told that IFAD would continue to support Sierra Leone. For SLBC News, ask me about. The Deputy Minister of Social Welfare, Gender and Children's Affairs, Rogia Tunenetri, has referred to child marriage as a human rights violation that is affecting developing countries. She made a statement at a press, con at a press conference marking the African Union campaign to end child marriage organized by women in the media Sierra Leone in collaboration with Planned Sierra Leone and UNICEF. Omubaka reports. And teenage pregnancy have been serious concerns, not only in Sierra Leone but also in other African countries. Given an overview of the program, the president of Women in the Media Sierra Leone, Tiana Alpha, said the African Union and Child Marriage Campaign is being implemented by the Office of the First Lady in collaboration with the Ministry of Social Welfare, Gender and Children's Affairs, and Women in the Media Sierra Leone with support from PLAN. UNICEF Sierra Leone and other partners. Madam Alpha said despite strides made by the government and other partners, child marriage continues to deny girls the opportunity to quality education. Child marriage continues to deny our young girls, the future leaders of our nation, their rights to quality education, proper growth, development, and to live in dignity. As an organization, we think that the media plays an integral part in providing public information and engaging communities in ending child marriage in Sierra Leone. Even though Winsal is leading this media engagement, I would also like to disclose that Yaka is also part of the media campaign team. The president of Winsal says the end of child marriage campaign is an ongoing process and the media's role is essential in providing public information and engaging communities in ending child marriage. A representative from the office of the First Lady, Sheku Nuni, said the most deprived and marginalized girls are at risk of child marriage. He stated that teenage pregnancy has been a major consequence of child marriage and contributes to about 40% of maternal deaths in Sierra Leone. Deputy Minister of Social Welfare, Gender and Children's Affairs, Rugiatu Nenetsuwe, said child marriage is a human rights violation. Today, we have a unique opportunity to act on this momentum and accelerate our efforts as a country to help to change the lives of girls and young women all over Sierra Leone. Child marriage is a human rights issue, and we should say, strong stand on banning it as a country. In developing countries, one in every three girls is married before age 18. Girls pressed into child marriage often become pregnant while still adolescents, increasing the risk of complication in pregnancy or child birth. Madam Therese says the ministry is aware that ending child marriage requires work across all sectors and understands the complex drivers behind the practice in different contexts. Even though the Child Rights Act and other documents says that children under the age of 18 cannot be given to marriage, yet the Customary Marriage Act says parents and other community stakeholders shall give consent for a girl at 16 to get or be given out for marriage. 
Head of Political Affairs Department at the United States Embassy in Freetown, Dr. Gauri Magio, has called on the Ministry of Political and Public Affairs. Uh, it's about strengthening coordination between the Embassy and the Ministry. Abubakar Bangwe reports. The Minister of Political and Public Affairs, Nanette Thomas, expressed delight for the visit. She explained the mandate of the ministry, especially in analyzing Sierra Leone's domestic political affairs and foreign relations, and furthering the nation's foreign policy to promote peace, security, and prosperity in Sierra Leone. The minister requested for a better working relationship with the political department of the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. government in a bid to inculcate the foreign and domestic policies of the U.S.A., her human rights situation, and other relevant political and social developments. The political chief of the United States Embassy in Sierra Leone, Dr. Gregory F. McGill, intimated the minister and her team about the roles and responsibilities of the political department of the embassy, especially in coordinating with other diplomatic missions, civil society, and multilateral institutions to fund an array of programming activities. These include supporting Sierra Leone's effort to further democracy, security, human rights, good governance, and respect for the rule of law. He said the political affairs department in the U.S. Embassy partners with a United Nations Development Program initiative to ensure bail and sentencing procedures in Sierra Leone are fair, more consistent and predictable equitable and in line with severity of crimes committed. Dr. Gregory F. McGill spoke about the political affairs department of the embassy supports to the groundbreaking work of the NGO Dignity Association to strengthen the Human Rights Commission of Sierra Leone, partners for democratic change and campaign for good governance to foster greater government accountability. That will be our last news item tonight. And we apologize, we cannot bring you business and sports due to some technical problem. And now to end the news, the main points again. Minister of Political and Public Affairs has presented members of the newly reconstituted African Peer Review Mechanism National Government Council to President Grima. Business tycoon and flag bearer aspirant of the APC, Mosri Fadika, is dead. Minister of Energy has called on solar equipment dealers to join the Renewable Energy Association. And the Minister of Health and Sanitation has established a functional national emergency medical service system. That's all in the news tonight. Many thanks to the news editor, Sheikh Sumala, and the rest of the production team. It's now time for us to join us Bar for issues in the news. Hello and welcome to Issues in the News from the Serial Broadcasting Corporation with me, Asmi Ba. Um, coming up, visiting International Fund for Agricultural Development President commits $20 million to sustain agricultural development in Sierra Leone. The President of the International Fund for Agricultural Development, a father, Dr. Kamnayo Nwanzi, has ended a two day visit to Sierra Leone. We are held high level meetings with uh, the President, sector ministries, donor agencies, farming groups, and the media. Well, this is the first time an IFAD, an, an IFAD president is visiting Sierra Leone since IFAD was established. Well, IFAD is the UN specialized agency that promotes uh, both agriculture and financial activities. Uh, well, in the studio to tell us about the outcome of the 
if a president's visit is a uh, over the PRO in the municipal for your first and for security. Welcome to the program, Mr. Drami. Uh, good afternoon, um, Asmi, and good afternoon to our viewers out there. Have you played host to the IFAD president, and I'm sure you were excited to see um, such a visitor to Sierra Leone. How will you describe the visit of uh, Dr. Mwanzi? Well, yes, um, Asmi, um, um, the IFAD president coming to Sierra Leone, it is uh, very, very uh, important to us because um, this is the first time a sitting IFAD president has come to our country, and um, that has brought a lot of uh, accolades and laurels to us. It is because of our profound commitment to the IFAD funded project and what we have done in the country. If you look at our um, report or results back in 20, uh, 2014, we are still was rated as the third best um, country for implementing IFAD uh, funded projects in the world. And um, ever since uh, we've been, I mean, I mean, implementing the IFAD funded project in country, a lot of strides, a lot of things have been done that have impacted our community, our rural people, such as um, rehabilitating Nila and Valley slums all around the country to help our farmers to uh, to boost production and productivity, the construction of community banks and financial service associations, which were the only functional banks during the Ebola in various places like um, Koinadugu district, places like Penemu in the Kailaun and um, other places around the country. To um, the support to uh, um, district um, offices in various um, districts like Kenema, Kailaun, Koinadugu and um, and um, and um, Kenema, Kailan, Kono, and Koinadugu. We are in um, what offices have been built all over the country, excluding Western area, to support the decentralization process in the country. So when you look at um, the IFA funded project, which is the International Fund for Agricultural Development, all what has been done in country, and now mind you, IFA has been in country for about 22 years before we had foreigners managing this project. And we had a Sierra Leone, we have a Sierra Leonean now managing this project with Sierra Leonean staff there. And they have been um, outstanding. That is to show, and I'm proud of that, to say that. So I'm, did Dr. Nwanzi visit um, the IFAD project to see for himself whether what has been told, well, I mean, what has been given to him was factual? Well, the way IFAD operates, um, um, as me, Dr. Nwanzi was in country for about three days. So he was unable to go to the provinces. But before Dr. Nwanzi came, they had a team from IFA that was here for about um, three weeks that went to IFA uh, projects all over the country. They went up country, went to all the four IFA that implemented this district, which are the four cases, Kenema, Kono, Kailan, and Koinadugu. And they, they went not just to the district headquarters towns, they went down to the, the villages and to see exactly not just the project, but how they do connect with our rural people and our community people, how these have changed the lives, have contributed in changing the lives of our people or the uh, other institutions, when I mean institutions, that business apparatus in these villages or in these chiefdoms. So he has all this report and that is why he came to Sierra Leone. And uh, coming into Sierra Leone, we have people that were there because we invited our paramount chiefs from all the um, from all the four districts because we had a co we had a cocktail for Dr. Nwanzi at Radisson and we had a, a dinner at the bank complex that was Friday night where we brought farmers in, we brought pa paramount chiefs from um, from all the four um, 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 so, Mr. Adam, districts. One of the, the high points of Dr. Nwanzi's visit was his announcement or his pronouncement of $20 million in the next two years for Sierra Leone. Well, um, that is where I'm coming to. That is the apex of um, everything that happened when Dr. Nwanzi was here. Because the paramount chiefs were there. The farmers, he met with the farm, par, farmers, he met with the president, His Excellency, Dr. Ernest Baikuruma, and from seeing a documentary, what has happened around the country. After all this, Dr. Nwanzi was pleased what what is happening in um, in the agricultural sector with the IFAD funded project. So he pronounced that the IFAD, IFAD will give a, an additional $20 million to Sierra Leone, depending if we implement it well, it could raise or it could rise up to $50 million. So because of the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the assurances he had from the IFAD funded project and the Minister of Agriculture, and mind you, the present Minister of Agriculture, which I normally say is a blessing for the agricultural sector and for the people of Sierra Leone, has worked with Dr. Nwanzi over the past 20 years and have been together forever. And um, because of so that... Is it because of the relationship that uh, Professor Monty Jones has with uh, Dr. Nwanzi that Sierra Leone is, is having all these goodies from IFAD? Well, you can look at it from different folds. You can say the, the um, relationship that um, Professor Monty Jones has with Dr. Nwanzi in different folds. It is a blessing. One, it is a blessing in this 
area that Dr. Manzi knows, Professor Monty Jones, he is his personal friend. Two, he's here to see what IFAL has done in country. And three, because he believes in the leadership of Professor Monty Jones, and he has worked with him for the past 20 years, and he knows that he's a man of his words and somebody that is forthright. Because of that, he can entrust twenty million dollars or going up to fifty one, million dollars in his hands. During his during the press conference after this in blue, one of the things that um, Dr. Nwanzi did say was that um, Sub-Saharan Africa spent billion more than twenty billion. I don't have the cost here. But he said more than twenty billion dollars or a billion dollars. So it's been spent on the importation of of food stuff that could have been planted in Sub-Saharan Africa. That alone would have boosted other sectors. Well, uh, yes, um, he did say that that sub-Saharan Africa will spend about 36 billion, I mean, billion 36 dollars. billion dollars to import foodstuffs that we could grow in, in I mean, in sub-Saharan Africa. And Sierra Leone is no exception. So um, these are some of the things that um, he, has, he is looking at because he is an African too. He's from uh, Nigeria. So we are looking at how we can eradicate all the importations or importation of foods. He was saying that um, if we can take uh, 36 billion dollars and put it into the economies of African countries. Definitely we can create jobs and this will be money that um, could help to stimulate um, this economy. And that is completely true. And Sierra Leone, we are going down and I mean, we are part of that. But notwithstanding that, that's why um, the IFAD, uh, the International Fund for Agricultural Development is supporting the agricultural sector. The Minister of Agriculture is moving towards that tribe, bringing in projects that could produce rice, that could do chicken, do eggs, and. Um, Onion and vegetable, these are the most things so that we are doing. So what kind of impression country. did Dr. Nwanzi leave Sierra with? Well, um, Dr. Nwanzi leaves Sierra Leone with uh, an impression of hope. Because um, he has given hope in the Sierra Leonean people, in the agricultural sector, to the IFA they are implementing units in, in country. And Dr. Nwanzi is so keen to see how Africa, how we can lift up Africa from what it is today to a better agricultural uh, continent to a better producing continent or continent that can feed itself, a continent that can use the $36 uh, billion, dollars. not sending it out to other companies out there, creating jobs for people in Europe and Asia, giving them foreign exchange, shipping your economy out to a continent that we can provide jobs for our people. If we want the expertise, we can import the expertise in, in, in continent and we can move forward. The hope that he has, give, he has given to um, Sierra Leone again was um, the $20 million, we all know where the agricultural sector is. We need more money to put into the agricultural sector, but we need to put the framework for us to attract well, the sector. Well, Mr. Jeremy, uh, um, as we are around the, the IFAD president is also, he came at a time when uh, most of the ABCs, some of them have been closed down, and a few other ones are going to be, be are, are now being, being looked at. No, that's a misstatement, ask me. No is ABC. It? No ABC will be closed down, and I say it authoritatively, no ABC. I've had these stories around and I've tried to correct it. We have built 392 agricultural business centers all around the country. They are operational, some are not fully operational. What we are doing is we have a project called the Global Agriculture Food Security Project that is being uh, overseen by the IFAD um, coordinating unit in country. They have money to capacitate. But at the moment, not, not, the, not all the 300 ABCs are functioning. So what well, would you say to that? If you talk about not all the 300 ABCs are functioning, I don't think that you check that directly on agriculture. You check that on my auntie in Krubola. You check that on my cousin in uh, Kombayende. You check that on my brother in, uh, in Musaya. Because government spend a lot of money, build the services, put machines there, and they should use it. So as, as the agriculture ministry of Sierra Leone, are you able to convince uh, Dr. Nwanzi that as a country we are on the right track in terms of um, achieving full security for the populace? Well, really, we do not need to convince Dr. Nwanzi because on a regular basis, on a, I mean, every uh, half of the year, they do send their uh, monitoring evaluation team to Sierra Leone to look at the IFAD funded project and what is going on. And Dr. Nwanzi had, had worked for Sierra Leone before in the Rokupu Rice Research Station in Cambia. So he knows exactly well, the models of around what is happening. Thank you very much, Abu Akar Dayan. That's it. Time has cut off. Uh, he is Abu Akar Dayan, the PR Minister of Agriculture. Thank you very much for being part of Fishing and the News. Thank you very much, Asmir. Okay, well, that's it. That's how we say goodbye to you. We join you again another day. Have a blessed evening. Goodbye.